His name is Paul Gallander, okay? This guy did more research on Sonny Liston than anybody else. They said he spent three years doing research on Sonny Liston, the mysterious life of Sonny Liston. This guy states that Sonny Liston was born in 1919. The guy who did the most research on Sonny Liston. Now it's being reported that Sonny Liston was born in 1932. And apparently that was um, a birth date Sonny Liston liked and that he came up with, okay? Because he had no idea how old he was. Now, I got several reports in my research from 1919 to he was being born in 1928, 29. They had um, census reports um, where he had different ages on those. The truth of the matter is, is that he did not have a birth certificate, okay? He caught a variety of charges. He had a long rap sheet, a terrible temper. Anybody who disrespected him and who ran across him, it didn't matter if it was law enforcement. Because he put hands on them too. He has the rap sheet to show it. At one time, he had went on a string of robberies and he was known as the Yellow Shirt Bandit. That was his nickname from what I read. And they was uh, looking for him and, you know, there was some newspaper clippings. I found some of that shit. You know, I did. I found some of it. And I will show you a little piece of um, Sun and Liston, and we'll get into this mystery. I'm going to show you this guy, Paul Gallander, who says that Sun and Liston was born in 1919. I don't know why somebody would want to erase 13 years of their life. Sun and Liston, he came up sharecropping. He was born in Arkansas, okay? There's a story about his mom eventually leaving and leaving him back with his father. And then he later left and joined up his mom in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, there's some conflicting years and things that would lead you to believe that he could have perhaps been, you know, when he moved to St. Louis, Missouri, he could have perhaps been, you know, um, around 10 or something like that in the early 30s, at least 10, you know, so I don't know how old he was. I definitely would say that he was not the age he was saying he was. He was definitely older than what he was saying. I don't know if it was by two years or if it was by 10 years or if this guy says um, 13 years, you know. Like I said, if he was really born in 1919, he would be older than Rocky Marciano by four years. He would be older than Sugar Ray Robinson, which means that when he was fighting in 1970, he was 50, 51 years old, if that's the truth. Now, I'm having a hard time believing that, man. I mean, that's a little bit of a stretch. I want to know what some of you guys think. I'm going to show you guys what this guy's claiming here. He's basically stating that Liston was 44 or some shit when... He fought Ali when he fought Cassius Clay. Which means that you know, he's older than Rocky Marciano. If that's the truth, then Marciano better be lucky that his life went the way it went. Because if that's the truth, he started hella late. He started hella late. Now watch this right here, and I'm going to be right back with you. Johnny Liston, the real story behind the Ali Liston fights. Joining me? The man who spent a quarter of a century researching and writing, Paul Gallander. Sir, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, John. Second best of all time to Ali, in your opinion? I think he was more talented than, than Muhammad Ali. Uh, I can make that case. But, yeah, I don't see anybody standing up to the man over a 15-round fight if he, if he was in shape and he, weren't, and he wasn't injured. In spite of the fact that in the 1960s he was already in his he was already in his 40s. Yeah, exactly. He was older when Ali fought him. People, people, you know, he was almost twice Muhammad Ali's age. I at believe that time. he was probably twice Muhammad Ali's age. I think he was probably born in 1919. At I believe he was probably twice Muhammad Ali's age. I think he was probably born in 1919. I believe he was probably twice Muhammad Ali's age. I think he was probably born in 1919. So we did. 
first thing his managers had to do was arrange for him to get a birth certificate, which claimed he was born on May 8, 1932. We know now from his early arrest records that he was born in either 1927 or 1928. In truth, it looked like Sonny was really uh, four or five years older than his listed age throughout his whole career. Sonny was probably twice as old as Muhammad Ali in that first fight. Um, because of the psychological warfare that Ali ran on, on Liston, Liston fought angry and he didn't train because nobody thought then Cassius Clay had a chance of winning that fight. And Sonny also had a severely injured left shoulder, tried to get the fight postponed, but the athletic commission would not let him postpone the fight. The second fight, he took a dive because his wife and his child were being held against their will. They were kidnapped. And Sonny was told, if you want to see them again, you have to lose. He was threatened by Mus the black Muslims. The black Muslims uh, are, are the people that had Sonny. They may have gotten the idea from the mob because the mob had resorted to those kinds of activities. Plus, in boxing terms, he was a very, very old man. I believe when Sonny fought Ali in 1964, he was probably 43 or 44 years old. There's, there's a lot of information that, that would lead that, uh, the conclusion. Plus, Sonny has said on a couple of occasions to people he trusted that he was a lot older than people thought he was. Okay, so I think it would be safe to say that Sonny Liston was older than what they had listed when he fought Ali, okay? There's no doubt about that. His whole career, he was definitely older than what the made-up birth certificate said the 1932 year maybe he um wanted to be a little younger too because he was late in the fight game now there's many people out there who feel that Sonny Liston is underrated and that his reign went overlooked I think that they might have a valid point maybe he has um been a little bit underrated you know what I find interesting is that if he was really born, say, even in 1920 or 1921, he would still be older than Rocky Marciano was when Marciano was going to see his fights. And you know how they'll bring the old fighters out before the fight back in the day. Rocky Marciano would um, come out there as one of the legends. And then they'll bring some current fighters in there, too that are popular, but during this time period, Marciano was actually younger than Sonny Liston. You know, and that's one of the problems I have with Marciano is there was no Sonny Liston on his resume. There wasn't that much of an age difference between Sonny Liston and Marciano, and I just don't think Marciano could have beat Sonny Liston at any time. Sonny Liston might even be older than Rocky Marciano. In fact, he's kind of right in between Rocky Marciano and Joe Lewis, according to some people. I'm not saying this because I don't know. I'm telling you, I don't know. It's pretty obvious that they don't know either because you have different people reporting different things. I read a lot of different articles and different people were saying different things. There was the issue with the census from the... Um, that they got from the early 40s and the um, 30s, the arrest records that displayed different ages, the way he made up his birth certificate. If it was 1919, then that's 13 years unaccounted for. Then the time where he left to find his mom. That's supposed to be the early 30s, and he was already, um, you know, 10 years old around, around that time. So... He was born either in the 20s or, or 1919. I think 1919 is stretching it. I would say he was born somewhere in the 20s, probably around Marciano's age, somewhere within Marciano's age, give or take one or two years. Him and Marciano should have fought each other. Marciano should have fought Floyd Patterson. Marciano should have fought Cleveland Williams. You know, um, it's just my opinion on the whole thing. But let's get back to Sonny Liston, okay? Sonny Liston fought until he was damn near 50 years old. Because we know he wasn't born in 1932. We know that. Did he take a dive in that second Ali fight? According to Paul Gallander, he did. Because, you know, I mean, you heard what the man said. <laughs> he 
you know, there's the threats being made and, you know, all of this stuff. And um, it's possible. It's possible that he took a dive. I wouldn't rule it out. I could tell you one thing. I don't believe Ali knew nothing about it if this was really true. Maybe he didn't have the back end of the mob that he had before. A lot of those guys got arrested and, you know, he had some beef with them too. He has a very interesting life, man. I'm not really sure if he was um, underrated or not. I'd like to know from some of you guys what you think. Was he underrated? Do you believe he threw that fight against Ali? Do you believe that he was really born in 1932? They just said he had no birth certificate, okay? He had no birth certificate. So, you know, and you've seen it in the documentary. They had to come up with um, an age for him. So they made the shit up. He definitely wasn't going to add some years to his um, real age. I, if, if, if they said 1919, I think they went overboard. I don't believe that he was born in 1919. If he was, he should have fought Joe Lewis and Marciano. If he was born in 1919, because, you know, like I said, Joe Lewis was only born in um, 1914. So there would have only been a five year difference between him and Lewis. So that's crazy if that's true. There was no doubt about it, man. The man had a bad temper. He wasn't the man to fuck with. I wouldn't want to be on his bad side. It sounds like he had a problem with law enforcement, too. But there's also those who say that he was a very intelligent man. No, he could not read or write. But he was very intelligent. I'm going to leave you guys with this. And I'll be back with the milestones. I'm out. Peace. He eventually started playing hooky and dropping out and not going to class, and his formal education didn't get very far. He never learned to read, uh, never learned to write. You know, he eventually got into robbery and, you know, stealing $6 from this guy and $9 from this guy and just roughing people up generally. From minor things all the way to armed robbery. And uh, he eventually went to prison in Missouri for armed robbery. And then after Sonny won the uh, championship of the prison very easily, uh, Father Stevens was so impressed. First he got Sonny a parole, and then later on he arranged for him to uh, introduce him into professional fighting, and so he got him some managers. He won the Golden Gloves here, and he went to the national championships, where he had three fights. None lasted more than three minutes. Not too long later, they took over control. He became a mob fighter. Sonny Liston first got out of prison in the, in the early 50s, and at that time he was taken over by the top mobster in St. Louis, Johnny Vitale. Vitale ran the rackets there in St. Louis. He was one of the nicest guys you ever wanted to see when he wasn't drinking. But when he got his little drink in him, he had a pop. In 1956, in a brawl with a police officer, the cop wound up with a broken knee, and Sonny managed to run off with the... Uh, the cop's gun and the cap. Him and the cop got into and the cop called him a black ass nigger. He pushed the cop and then uh, he took the cop gun and he got seven months for it. And I didn't get him that night, but we got him a couple of nights later. Of course, I took him in the alley and talked to him, talked his language and he understood what I meant. Nobody wanted to get killed. Nobody wanted to get the head caved in. I said, that's what's going to happen if you keep fucking around here. After that uh, break in the policeman's knee, Sonny was picked up and put back in the workhouse. And then uh, after his release, he wound up in another fight with the policeman, wound up putting him upside down in the trash barrel. But now the police was tired of arresting him, and they just told him, get out of town or else. He was managed, finally, I think, as a front by a guy named Joseph Pep Barone, who was a friend of Palermo's. It was after he moved to Philadelphia that uh, Sonny really became a force in boxing. What a tremendous left jab and a great hook. And he just started beating up on people like uh, Zora Foley and Cleveland Williams and Eddie Mason. He just destroyed people. Well, from the outset, I'd say that Sonny Liston belongs among the five greatest heavyweights of all time. 
He had a left jab in front of him, which was probably the best in all heavyweight history. Had the kind of a jab that went through you. Now, here's a guy who came into the gym and would hit the speed bag so hard that it would come off its hinges. He knocked the stuffing out of the headgear. I mean, this guy could really hit the stitching on the headgear. When he hits you, came apart. I think it's fair to say that he was considered like a Joe Lewis, like a Mike Tyson, or even in the way that George Foreman was considered early in his career as this absolutely fearsome, unbeatable force of nature. This was the toughest guy on the planet. He literally hammered out danger. And when Sonny Liston came into the ring scowling at you, the guy started bleeding during the national anthem. And I've been having real ones. Who asked the question? You over there? After watching you spar today, it seems that you plan a vastly increased use of your right hand. Is this true? I'm planning on using both of them. <clears throat> both of them? Right. Sonny was uncomfortable dealing with the press. So he'd usually answer a question with uh, one word or maybe just an angry stare. He didn't like reporters or the media um, or maybe even the public. He sat there, this 14-inch face, clenching and unclenching, and those cobra eyes staring at you. He was, he was fearsome. The man was terrifying. He had a reputation as a fearsome puncher as a potential rival for heavyweight champion Floyd Patterson. The problem was his name began to appear on the front pages of the newspaper more than in the sports sections of the newspaper. And immediately that turned off a lot of people. He had a number of brushes with the law, which were quite unusual for a celebrity athlete in those days. After he busted the cop's leg in St. Louis, he was a branded man for any police department anywhere in the country. All the Philadelphia squad cars had a picture of Sonny Liston taped to their sun visors. At least there was an informal bush telegraph at work between the St. Louis police and the Philadelphia police. The word had gone out, you know, harass this guy. Put the screws to him wherever you get the chance. Who do you want to fight in the ring in your next engagement? The man got the title. Mr. Floyd Patterson, currently the heavyweight champion. Let us ask you this, Sonny. What, are you, uh, what have you heard are your chances of getting that title fight? I think it's very good from what I hear. There was a, an awful lot of controversy at the time whether this morally reckless person, quote unquote, actually was worthy of fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world. Well, I fought all the top contenders, and I fought my way up to the number one spot. So what do a man have to do to get an honest shot at the title? Liston's handlers were trying to arrange a fight with uh, Floyd Patterson, the heavyweight champion, and with Sonny's already known ties with the mob and his arrest record, they were having a problem. Custy Amato, who was Floyd Patterson's trainer-manager, he knew that Floyd Patterson probably didn't have a chance in hell of beating Sonny Liston and avoided him and avoided him and avoided him on the pretext that Sonny was involved with the mob and that he was an undesirable and that the heavyweight championship of the world should not be contested by a man of his ilk. Well, when a fighter started making excuses like he wouldn't want to fight another fighter because of certain things he have did, there must be some doubt in that fellow's mind that he can't beat the other fighter. Liston was very problematic because he had come from prison, because he had these ties with organized crime. And those things wouldn't have been bad necessarily for either the white public or the black public, except that he came along during the height of the civil rights movement. The NAACP in particular was looking for black role models, blacks to look up to. Floyd Patterson was one of those. The NAACP, they were very unhappy with uh, Liston's negative image, and uh, they begged Patterson, please don't take the fight. 
they didn't want me to fight him either because there was a good chance of him winning the fight. And I guess uh, uh, if he should win the fight, he would represent the black race. I just felt that here's a man who's had a very similar life to mine, and I felt that he should get a chance, so I overrode my manager and I gave him a shot. Uh, I think he's proved himself as far as being the number one contender is concerned. I personally think that he has every right to fight for the championship, despite his, despite his unfortunate background. Customato had no choice. He had to make the fight. So they fought September 25th, 1962 in Chicago. And Floyd Patterson came into the ring, obviously terrified. He was like Ken Norton fighting George Foreman. He was like Michael Spinks fighting Mike Tyson. All you had to do was look at their eyes. And they were out already. They already had a glaze. And you knew, looking at Floyd Patterson, that it wasn't going to last very long. Public would uh, let bygones be bygones, that I would be a good champion. Maybe a better champion he would, or either just as good a champion. After Sonny won the title in Chicago, he was going through on a United flight back some of the things he was going to say at his reception at the airport. And he said, I know a lot of my own people were against me. He said, I want to prove to them that I'm not going to disgrace them, I'm not going to embarrass them, that I'm going to make them proud. So when we finally landed in Philadelphia, he took a step outside the door of the cockpit and stood there for a moment, and he was looking. I could see him look both ways, and it was no, nothing. There was no evidence of any kind of activity, of organized activity in the way of welcome. And I could just see almost the air go out of him. I mean, these big broad shoulders in front of me just seemed to sag with the recognition that there was no welcome here for him. Even after he became champion, the Philadelphia police, they went right on harassing him and just uh, petty things, picking him up for standing on a street corner talking to someone. For Sonny, the last straw is when they picked him up in the park for driving too slowly. It was after that driving too slow in the park that he said that he was going on to Denver and that he would rather be a lamppost in Denver, I think he said, than a, uh, the mayor of Philadelphia. When Geraldine's wife was out of town, you'd drink too much. And that white caddy is, he'd get in it, and you'd run stop signs, and you'd exceed the speed limit, and he'd get stopped over and over and over. The police was picking on something. They, when they saw his car, they would follow him. He loved to drink and he would get out of hand. He might pick up some girls, go to the hotel room. As soon as they saw Sonny's car, they would pull him over. A few of the Denver police harassed Sonny Liston, and I thought treated him very bad. If he would step one foot onto the golf course where he ran, I was with him. They were there to give him a ticket on it. For some reason, Patterson wanted a rematch, and in 1963, Sonny said, come on, I'll give you one. Of course, it was another disaster for Patterson, one round knockout. Jim Murray of the Los Angeles Times wrote, the sports world must realize that it now has Sonny Liston to keep. Then he added, it is like finding a live bat on a string under your Christmas tree. He was not a popular champion in the American press. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the heavyweight champion of the world, Sonny Liston. So let's bring him on here with a big hour. Even when Sonny started doing positive things like uh, appearing on the Ed Sullivan Show, he couldn't shake that image of this silent, sullen brute. Atlanta, Georgia. Raleigh, North Carolina. Sonny was awesome in his workouts. The highlight is when he skipped rope to night training. Well, 
There is this public image of Sonny, the ex-convict, the former labor goon, his known ties in with the mob. But the people that knew him, they saw a much, much different picture. How old are you now? 31. Still 31? Yeah. Are you ever going to be 32? No, I'm like Jack Benner. <laughs> Resnick wasn't the only problem for Sonny at that time. While training for the second Patterson fight, Liston began getting harassed by Cassius Clay, then no more than a young, loudmouth heavyweight contender out of Miami. I saw Sonny Liston a few days ago, Cassius. Ain't he ugly? <laughs> he's, he's too ugly to be a world champ. The world champ should be pretty like me. Don't you have any respect for him at all as a fighter? As a fighter, I think he should be locked up uh, impersonating a fighter. I think the seeds for Sonny's destruction at the hands of Clay began in the last few days before the second Patterson fight. As we were crossing the casino, Liston stopped dead in his tracks and he held up his hand like this for the whole entourage of people are bumping into him from behind. You know, everybody stopped when he stopped. He pointed over on his right hand side and over at the crap tables was Cassius Clay. Clay looked up and Liston smacked him right across the mouth as he looked up. Whack! Smacked him right across the mouth. Clay said, what would you do that for? And Sonny said, because you too bleeping fresh. And he turned around and just walked away and everybody's walking with him. And Sonny said, I got the punk's heart. He felt invincible. He felt that he could knock anybody out. So Sonny was, you know, full of himself. He was overconfident. Uh, he was running around with women other than his wife. He was doing things that no fighter should do. He was dissipating. And, and very, very little real work training for the fight with Clay. There were legitimate fighters who were lined up as sparring partners. Sonny wouldn't touch him. Sonny wouldn't get into the same ring with them. He felt that he didn't need it because he thought he was going to go through clay like a wet paper bag. What about Cassius? Well, I was imagine uh, if he would come to me, I'd kill him. And if he ran him, I'd catch him and kill him. You tell me to your camera, your TV man, your radio man, and you right by the whole world. If Sonny lives to hook me, I'll kiss his feet in the rain. To say that clay Clay wasn't taken seriously as an opponent for Liston before their first fight is an understatement. Nobody knew what Cassius Clay would become. This was a very confusing time for people. Uh, Clay wasn't liked because he was a braggart who hadn't really proved himself. And guys would say, I'd like to see Sonny button his lip. But on the other hand, they didn't want Sonny either. <laughs> so there was this curious kind of sense of uh, not knowing exactly who to pull for. Going into the fight, you have the situation at the weigh-in. Sonny thought that he would give, uh, you know, Ollie the old stare down, give him the evil eye, you know, scare the crap out of him, and that, that would be it. But at the way, and Sonny was completely upstaged. I mean, Ali completely freaked out. The opinion of most of the observers was that these hysterics that Clay was going through were fear. But of course they weren't. He was psyching the old bear out. Clay and Liston finally met in Miami Beach on uh, February 25th, 1964. I think that what happened that night was that Sonny really expected that uh, when he took his robe off, that Clay was going to be just about ready to, to collapse. Well, the first thing that occurred to me was that Clay had a plan and seemed to have the quickness and the nerve to deal with this malevolent force. In and out, punch, hold, there was something happening in there that we couldn't all quite understand. Everyone thought, well, 
sooner or later he's going to stop and Liston is going to hit him, but then it became apparent that Liston was getting a little frustrated. Sonny suddenly realized, wow, this is something I've never, never been up against in the ring. Here was a finely tuned, magnificent young athlete in front of him. And here was an out of shape, middle aged guy who didn't train a lick and thought he was just going to go in there, throw a few punches, and it would be all over. It was the thing that gave Sonny his identity. He was the toughest guy in the world. And suddenly he woke up one morning and he wasn't the toughest guy in the world. So he decided to do something about it. And he trained like he hadn't trained in years. You feel you're sharper physically than you've been in the past. Yes, I do. I feel that I'm in the best shape of my life. There are many people that feel that uh, if the uh, second fight had come off as scheduled, uh, Sonny would have regained the title. Ali uh, unexpectedly came up with a hernia, and the fight was postponed. And by now, the FBI was even investigating leads that there might be a fix in the works for the second fight. John Metelli was living at that time, and uh, he says, don't pay any attention to what you hear about the next fight. You ought to be glad you're not going with him. And I said, why is that? He said, the fight's going to be a one-round fight. As bad as all this may have looked, people seem to feel even more threatened by Clay's new allegiance to this mysterious nation of Islam. Why do you insist on being called Muhammad Ali now? Well, that's the name given to me by my leading teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's my right. original name. That's a black man named Cassius Clay was my slave name. I'm no longer a slave. The thing that bothered me is Liston could take a hell of a punch. I'd seen them fight guys that were devastating punches. I'd seen them fight those guys. I've seen those guys knock the daylights out of him for a while, but then he would always come on to knock him out. He threw the fight. He went to his grave. He never told me. And if he threw it, I didn't see none of the money. I went in the back in the dressing room, and uh, he was all by himself. I said to him, I know how you feel. I've experienced this myself. He didn't say one word. He didn't say anything. He just kept looking and looking. And he had that mean look on his face. And I don't think he knew he had the mean look. But I kept on talking anyway. And finally I said, I don't think I'm reaching him. So I said, okay, I'll see you later. So I went to walk out the door. And before I get out the door, he ran up and put his arms on my shoulder. I turned around and he said, thanks. You know, then I knew then that I reached him. But Sonny was disgraced after the first clay fight. After the second one, boy, he, he really bottomed out. And everybody sort of expected him to just disappear. But Sonny did not disappear. Boxing was his livelihood. He hadn't made nearly as much money as one might suspect he had made. And he continued to fight on. We went to, to uh, Sweden. He did an exhibition in Sweden. We traveled around and made a few dollars. And then after we came back, we moved to Las Vegas. Sonny fit in well in Las Vegas. You have to remember, you know, the gambling casinos were founded by gangsters. Sonny fit well into that picture. He wasn't harassed by the cops. People didn't care about his background. You know, he was comfortable there. Sonny slowly began rebuilding his career. Between 1966 and 69, fighting inferior opponents. He won 14 straight matches. One of his sparring partners was George Foreman, who was an Olympic champion at the time. Ironically, it was during this period that uh, Sonny's image began to soften. He landed uh, a movie role, some TV roles. No, no, no. Oh, are you married? Married? Are you kidding? I can get in the dame I want. All I have to do is to put out my hand and grab. Do you want any ice cream? Remember, there's an inherent beauty in soup cans that Michelangelo could not have imagined existed. 
Talkative Andy Warhol and Gabby Sonny Liston always fly Braniff. After Sonny moved to Vegas, he became more and more under the influence of Ash Resnick. He started hanging around with the wrong people. Friends of his were told by police out in Las Vegas that Sonny's hanging out with the wrong folks. There's a drug deal going down and Sonny's involved in it. There were all kinds of allegations as to what Sonny was doing. There were those that say he'd gone back to his old job as collecting debts for the mob. There were those that say he was pushing heroin. But uh, Sonny was pretty much just being Sonny Liston, doing the same kind of things, associating with the same kind of people he always had. There were the two faces of Sonny Liston. One of the faces was this man who was totally abstinent, perfectly well behaved, but around people that he ran with in the night, he behaved another way. There was a Jekyll and Hyde aspect to his personality. Any chance that Sonny had it for another shot of the title was lost in 1969 after he was knocked out by uh, a former sparring partner, Leotis Martin. After that, Sonny had just one more fight. In June of 1970, he fought Chuck Webner. He was known as the Bayonne Bleeder. It's a typical Webner fight. He bled all over the place, and Sonny won on a TKO. Sonny was paid $13,000. Right away, he paid $10,000 of that to repay a, a loan, and the other $3,000 he gave to his cornerman. He wound up with nothing, and he had nothing. He was, at that point, he was just about broke. His wife, Geraldine, was out of town over the New Year holidays. She had tried to reach Sonny on the phone, but she couldn't get him. And she cut her holiday short because she was worried. She arrives in Las Vegas around 8.30, 8.45, and drives home. She pulls up to the house on Ottawa Drive, and she notices the lights are all out of the house. Well, I went in the back car porch, and I went for the few steps up. And it was a terrible smell. So I went in and I said, ooh, you know, I said, he must have cooked and um, left something on the stove. So I went in the kitchen and I didn't see anything. So I went a few more little steps up to the bedroom and I seen him laying to his side. So I said, I think Sonny's dead. 